Okay, we're now live and people are joining us. Right. Um, you're all very welcome, um, everybody who's coming in. Um, so we're waving at them. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> For all those who pay, nurse, no nurse, or friend. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, uh, the numbers are going up, so that's really terrific. Um, that's... You're all very, very welcome. This is a webinar. We, we were, we've done meetings in the past and webinars, but because we've got a big group, we figured it was easier to do it this way. Um, and if you have a question or um, any, any comment at all, you can just put them in the Q&A box or the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And we will deal with those after Tony's given his presentation. Um, I'm gonna wait till we've got a few more people before I actually do my formal introduction of Tony. Um, I've done a lot of work with Tony over the years. My name is Jane Stevenson and I have seminars.ie. And I've done a lot of events with Tony in the past, and we always get extremely good feedback. Um, Tony, I'll, I'll do a little bit of background on Tony as we've got we've got quite a large group now. Um, Tony is a is a consultant clinical psychologist, and he's been doing this. I was trying to pin him down on how many years he's been doing this, and we reckon it's about forty years. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a man with a lot of experience um, in this field and he's written a number of books. He said, well, first of all, he's, he's been doing this for about 40 years. He's a consultant clinical psychologist in private practice and he does do um, specialist um, healthcare lectures in University College Cork and, U and University, of, University of Limerick. Um, LIT. Um, he's currently at the moment, he teaches a master's, a level nine master's in psychotherapy and relationship mentoring in LIT, um, a level eight psychotherapy and relationship mentoring higher diploma in UCC, and a level seven interpersonal communication uh, higher diploma in UC, UCC. So um, he's He's also written a number of books. He's the author of Work and Work, Take Back Your Life, The Power of Negative Thinking, which was one of his original books. Um, a there's a lot of books that he's written. Self-Esteem, The Key to Your Child's Education, The Family, Love It and Leave It, Myself, My Partner, A Different Kind of Discipline, Children Feeling Good, Examining Our Times, Whose Life Are You Living? Many books, and I'm sure you've probably got a few more since this list of I've got here. 20 books, yeah. <clears throat> 20, yeah. Um, the, more recent ones, recorded... the most recent ones are important, right? Creating Psychological Safety and the Breakthrough Book on Couple Relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, and you haven't actually written a book on, on dreams. No, no. I, I plan okay. to read, write one on Dream On, but in preparing for the lecture, there are a lot of books on dreams already, and I want to recommend, recommend a particular one, but I think I don't need it. I don't, I don't think another dream book is needed, but I have a plan for my okay. next book, all right, but it won't be on dreams. But I'm going to keep that a secret okay. now. <laughs> <laughs> um. But you are, Tony this evening will be, will be talking um, because, you know, I think it's much better for, for to see, listen to him, um, but he does have some slides which we will send out after the present tomorrow. We'll send the, a copy of the slides to everybody who is booked. And we will also be sending a link to the recording. So uh, several people haven't been able to make it to this, this live uh, talk. So they will be getting the recording automatically tomorrow, a link to the recording, which will be accessible for 30 days. Um, and, and, and we will be sending all that to you anyway, those of you who are here this evening. Um, we'll be sending you the recording link and the slides. Um, so I think we can probably start. We've got, we've got over 100, so I think that's probably a good position to start in. And I just want to read out what the 
who the description of this evening was, because I think it's lovely and obviously it's it's appealed to a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are very interested in the whole area of dreams. I know I am. And when you have particularly vivid dreams, you're just dying to know what they mean. So just to repeat again, um, that you will be able to ask questions after Tony has talked and I will feed them through to Tony after he's given his presentation. So this is um, the description of this evening. Dreams are gifts from the soul. They tell you where you are and where you need to go. Indeed, dreams are stories and are always meaningful. Symbolism is the nature tongue of your dreams, the language of the soul. Tony will explore how dreams allow the real inner you to show and how to begin to interpret them, particularly lucid dreams. A dream which is not interpreted is like a letter which is not read. Mm. And that's Talmud. So Tony, I will hand over to you now and, um, and then we will, I'll pick you up again after your presentation to feed through the questions. Great, thanks Jane, thank you. <clears throat> so I can start, ah, that's good, good. Go ahead. Okay. okay, good. Welcome everybody. I'm just, sorry, I can't see your faces and see what's going to happen to you as I talk, right? <laughs> Not a mind saying your bodies. Um, but <clears throat> I suppose I want to start with dreams have been very significant in my own life and they continue to be so. Um, and then gradually, you know, when I began to work with individuals who are suffering their dreams, um, really brought up very deep issues that they hadn't spoken about consciously, but the dreams were trying to draw attention to them. And <clears throat> I suppose I want to start with a few dreams of my own and then go on to look at, you know, the nature of dreams and how, how we can look at them and examine them. And <clears throat> a lot of you will know, right, that, you know, um, I was two months from ordination uh, as a priest and was a deacon at the time, <clears throat> um, but had stopped believing in Catholicism, not spirituality, but in Catholicism. And um, the I wrote a letter home to my invalid mother and my father um, saying that this was going to come as a shock to them, but there were certain teachings of the church telling a little bit of truth. There are certain teachings of the church that I wouldn't go along with, and given those reservations, it would be hypocritical of me to go forward for the priesthood. A little bit of truth. Um, and when, it, when the letter went home, it was read to my mother, who was in her uh, invalid chair, and any time there was a crisis, my mother was amazing, she'd faint. So when the letter was read, she fainted. Um, and very sadly wrote back to me in her crippled hand, if you come out, I'll die, right? And my father wrote back in a very aggressive hand, if you come out, I'll never talk to you again. Now, I didn't realize at that time that was about where they were at. I personalized it. I felt rejected. I felt not heard. I, you know, I decided when I got the letters, I was going to go ahead with the priesthood. And my plan was the order I was in was a French order, an enclosed order, and at a house out in South America. <clears throat> and my plan was I'll go ahead with the ordination, I'll come back to Cork, say Mass in the local church, bless all the locals, and then I will volunteer to go out to the house in South America. No, come on, good plan, right? Um, and so that was my plan. And then I had a dream. And it was a very short dream, a very powerful dream. <clears throat> and it was interesting that at that time, I was due to get ordained in November. In the August, I had actually been hospitalized because I was bringing up lungs from some part of my body and went into a hospital to try and discover the source of the, where the blood was coming from. And they did test after test after test. But they couldn't find the source. And after about, I don't know, 10 days or so, they discharged me and said, come back maybe in three months and we'll try again. 
Now, the dream was, right, very, very short, Tony, if you go down the road once again now of pleasing others, you are in great danger. And of course, <clears throat> what really put the truth in that dream, because I was still bringing the blood up, right? And what the dream was saying to me, if you continue now to go down the road, which was my, which is what I learned as a child to please others all the time, you're in great danger. And the blood convinced me of it, right? And it was interesting, blood, right, even symbolically means blood ties, right? And I needed to try and separate, and I needed to be true to my own life and not to be living my mother's life or my father's life or anybody else's life for that matter. And so if I hadn't had been, if I hadn't been bringing up blood at that time, I think I would have ignored that dream, right? But the blood convinced me. And I went down, we used to get up at half past five in the morning. So I went down to listen to the title to Father Superior and uh, um, told him that I had decided I was going to leave. Uh, he was a bit happy that I was leaving because he felt I was influencing the other monks, which to some degree I was, I'd say. Uh, but it was interesting, my spiritual director said to me when I said I was going, which is something I didn't see in myself at the time, he said, oh, Tony, I thought you would stay and change things, uh, which was an interesting observation. So I did leave, <clears throat> and an older brother of mine came up and collected me, and drove me back to Cork. Why I went back to Cork, I don't know, right? But I didn't know where I was going to go. I had no money, I had a black suit. What am I going to do, right? I'm 25 years of age. I don't have any degrees. <clears throat> I didn't know what I was going to do. So I went home and the, um, I was in a long home in a way, nobody spoke. And I went in the front door of my home one of the days and I overheard my mother, because because of her invalid condition, neighbors would visit her a lot. I overheard her saying, oh, he's such an embarrassment to have around now. Now that was heartbreaking, uh, but it was the best thing I ever heard. Because the following day, I had the vestments, I had the chalice, the shop where they were bought kindly, um, took them back, gave me some money. I bought myself a gray suit and went to Dublin, um, found a, um, some digs there, and had a di very difficult five years, but nonetheless, I managed to do two degrees at night, managed to teach primary and secondary school. But it was very fascinating, though. When I went to Dublin that time, I was very depressed, quite suicidal, um, but very much a loner. I had two very powerful dreams again. And the first dream was, was I was in the middle of an earthquake <clears throat> down in the city, and all the ground was opening up and all the buildings were being swallowed up and people were being swallowed up and cars and everything. And as myself and a group of people, <clears throat> the city was on, on the side of a kind of a mountain. And we reckoned if we ran up the mountain and got up to a certain height, we, we would be, um, we would be saved. And, and particularly the group of people with me felt, well, if, because about one of the third, one third way up, there was a church. And the, the group of people with me believed if they got to the church, they got into the church, they would be saved, right? So my second group, we, we reached the church, right? And they all ran into the church. But in the dream, I knew the church was going to collapse. So I went into the church and I persuaded them, this church is going to collapse. You need to follow me if you're going to be saved. So I came out of the church and all the people followed me out of the church. And when I came out of the church and I looked up the mountain, I saw a very clear path going up the side of the mountain. And people all followed me up that path. And when we got up high and we looked down, we saw the church collapse. And that dream, it was such a support for me. It really, it was actually quite prophetic in many ways, because many dreams are prophetic. It was telling me, it was a part of me 
the group of people that went into the church and believed that they were going to be saved in the church were the parts of me that figured, listen, nobody wants me, nobody wants to see me, I'm an embarrassment, right? So maybe I'll just go back to the church. And there was that temptation in me, lots of parts of me, there was that temptation to go back to the church and at least I'll have some recognition, right? Um, but then there was a part of me that knew the church had collapsed for me, right? And that was the part that the dream was showing that I needed to listen to. And then when I did listen to it, then this path appeared that I was going to find my own path, which I eventually did. But that dream really very much supported me uh, during that time. I had a sense, right, I was on a journey. Um, and it offered me so much hope. And it was interesting, at the same time, I had another dream where I was out walking in the countryside and I saw this stampede of horses, you know, racing down a road, right? And suddenly I saw this little child in the middle of the road, totally oblivious to the stampede that was coming his way. And I knew that child was myself. And I ran in front of the stampede, I grabbed the child and we rolled over to the side of the road, just barely missing the stamp being stamped to death, to death, right? And I knew again that dream was showing me, you know, that I had so much, I, I was in a stampede, I had been stamped totally, I wasn't wanted, I was an embarrassment, right? Um, and I needed to save myself. And that stampede had started when I was a child been there for everybody else, but not at all been there for myself. So in, in the midst of a deep depression at the time, both of those dreams gave me such hope. And so dreams, <clears throat> they can tell you about your physical health, your emotional well-being, your relationships, your work, your mind, your heart, your ambitions, wishes and desires. They bring you closer to who and what you truly are in the deepest inner reaches of your being. And working with them can be the best thing you can ever do for yourself. You can make your dreams come true and live them in the, in the fullest sense. And like, you know, Jane, when she was introducing the talk, she quoted a uh, famous, our favorite author of mine, James Hollis, dreams of gifts from the soul, they tell you where you are and where you need to go to. Um, and they certainly have done that for me and continue to do so, as we'll see. And a lot of people bring me their dreams. You are the best interpreter of your dreams. But somehow to see the meaning of your dream can be very frightening and can be very challenging, as I know myself. And sometimes you go to somebody else, go, oh, can, can you give me the meaning of that dream? And all I, well, all I will do then is say, well, it could be this, it could be that. But you will know when it clicks for you, that resonant moment, right? That, that kind of ding moment. Oh, yeah, that's what it means, right? Um, but I am not the expert in somebody else's dreams. The person who created them is the expert. But I can certainly explore the possibilities. And then you will tell me when I hit on, um, oh, yeah, Tony, that's what it means. And I love that the quote by Carl Jung, within everyone is a much greater person and dreams are a spokesperson. And how many of us really uh, appreciate the gift that our dreams are? There's an adage that says, nothing of any consequence happens in your life that hasn't been previewed in a dream. Well, wow, that's quite deep, isn't it? Um, but actually I believe it's true. So tr trust in dreams, right? For in them is the hidden gate to eternity. It reminds me that, you, you know, some people uh, in the audience will know I run retreats in, in Greece. And uh, at one point, um, during the, I take 20 people for a week. Um, and at one point, and for one group, we had all got together and we were chatting. I think it was on this, the second day, I think. Um, and somebody mentioned about dreams uh, during the session. And um, 
a man who had never, I'd never met before. It was his first time being in any group of mine. And he said very quietly, I never dream. You know, you see, even that, even the, his tone of voice revealed to me so much about that man. Remember, every gesture, tone of voice, the eye contact, right? The body posture, right? The facial expression, you know, presents about where we are within ourselves, right? And this man's whisper told, spelled volumes for me, but only he could tell me what the story was to those volumes, right? And then when he said, I never dream, another man in the audience said, ah, come on now, we all dream, right? And I said to this man who said, we all dream. I said, listen, I'm hearing what you're saying. I hear that you dream. But I'm also hearing that this other man here doesn't dream. And I'm hearing what he's saying. And I said to the man who said I, that he, he never dreams, <clears throat> I said, can I just make a little suggestion and just maybe try it out if you wish, right? But when you go to bed tonight <clears throat> and you're beginning to nod off, just say to yourself, Mm, I will remember my dreams clearly in the morning. And that's giving yourself permission to allow our unconscious to become conscious. I will remember my dreams clearly in the morning. And at the following day, um, <clears throat> they all stay in a place in this lovely beach area. And then I would collect some of them and we drive up to the retreat center, which is up in the mountain, about up in the mountain, looking over the sea. Um, and so when I got to the, the taverna where they're all having breakfast, whatever look I gave over, I saw this man that, that said, I never dream. He seemed much more alive or something. Um, anyway, Ford then came into the car with me, and then we have a, another bus that brings up the others uh, to the retreat center. So we got up to the retreat center and then later on we started the morning and we had no sooner started when somebody said in the group let's say i'll give pictures his name oh john had a dream last night i said john oh my god I'm, I'm, i'd love to hear it he said okay now the dream was this man was a truck driver <clears throat> and he's up on a high road and he gets into his truck he closes the door puts on the seatbelt, turns on the ignition, puts her into first gear, but the car or the truck keeps going backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards, and it gradually begins to slide down into a very deep ravine, all the way down, and he's terrified, right? Absolutely terrified. And he can't control it, and he just goes back and back and back and back, and eventually he's at the bottom of the ravine, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And then the truck doors opens, and this other man says, move over, right? And he moves over, and this man gets in, closes the door, puts on the seatbelt, turns on the ignition, and slowly but surely begins to slip slide up the ravine. What an amazing dream, right? For his first dream. And the dream, you know, and it made total sense to him when we talked about it, the dream was that <clears throat> lots of things had happened to him in his life, lots of hurts, lots of abandonments, right? And we need to go, we need to go backwards, all the way back to the beginning of all our hurts, right down to the bottom of the ravine. And then the man that opened the door, right, and said, move over, was now himself in the present, now willing to begin to travel that road less traveled, that road into our hidden hurts, that road into freeing ourselves of those hurts, but slowly but surely going up that, that mountain of hurts that he had experienced. What an amazing dream for a first dream. And you see the wisdom of it, right, and the power of it. So trust and dreams for in them is the hidden gate, right, to yourself, to your, your own person, but also to eternity. <clears throat> there are kind of five main facts about dreams, right? <clears throat> One, you know unconsciously what your dreams mean. I can assure you of that. 
you are the expert, like I said already. And dreams are stories, number two. And figuring them out is similar to analyzing a novel or a movie. A dream is a story and it's always meaningful. Now, sometimes you need to make the distinction between having a dream and dreaming, right? Dreams that are not structured as stories are better understood as dreaming, a succession of images and sensations you experience while asleep. Dreaming can start soon after you close your eyes, and it doesn't really, really mean anything important. It is where there's a story in the dream, that's the dream that's looking to be interpreted. And everything in your dreams is symbolic. Now, I mean, symbolism is such a, a magic language of the soul, right? It's part of our nature. It's part of our, yeah, of our soul. It is, it is a native tongue of your dreams. Indeed, the language of the soul was an amazing language. And it's one that we're not taught. It is there in our, in our soul, in our being. Because if you take a dream literally, I can assure you, you have found a way to not interpret it. And I remember a woman that was coming to see me and she was telling me, Tony, I have this recurring dream. It just keeps recurring to me and I'm always going off to Malaysia. And I said to her, oh, Malaysia. She said, I don't even know where Malaysia is. Oh, I said, you do. You know very well where it is. Because every day you go to Malaysia. This woman had no zest for life. She just wanted to stay in bed all day. And look at the wisdom of, that, of her soul to bring, to capture that country, right, of Malaysia, to represent the Malays that she went to, the country she went to every day. And it was very interesting. Um, I was giving a talk down in Killarney there a couple of years ago, and I mentioned that Malaysia dream. And this woman came up to me at the end, she's a businesswoman, probably late 40s. And she said, she, she said, Tony, I have a recurring dream. And I'm always going off to Alaska. And she said, I don't know what it means. I just don't know what it means, right? And I said, well, I'm curious, I said, you know, how good now would you be um, at asking people for help or support? Oh, she said, I never ask, right? Now, alas, A-L-S-A, A-L-A-S, right? Alas. And then I said to her, how about people asking you? Oh, they all ask, Alaska. I mean, look at the wisdom of that, right? Here in that one word, Alaska, captured her whole life. She never asked anybody for anything, alas. And she allows everybody to ask for of her, and that's the Alaska. That's the country she lives in every day. And it's fascinating, Alaska then is also known as the frozen north. And what was frozen in her was her right to ask that relationship is about giving and it's about receiving. And it's, it's like, it, it clicked for her very quickly, right? But again, the wisdom of choosing just that one word, Alaska. So dreams have meaning because something at the core of the mind steps into the dreaming process and uses it for a deeper process, a deeper purpose. Dreams help you process, help you learn, help you emerge, and somehow it all ties in with why consciousness exists in the first place and its role in an infinite universe. And a map for higher consciousness, soul knowing, is embedded in the mind from birth. And it's good to see that your dreams are stories, like I said, through symbolism. And every detail, for example, of a motion picture or a novel is chosen deliberately. Your dreams take the same care and pay the same attention to detail. A dream setting sets the scene. I'll give you an example now in a second. It's the stage in which the story unfolds. Like my 
the earthquake dream. Without a setting, the story is not anchored in place and time. The setting is symbolism, such as when a home improvement store symbolizes improving yourself, or your home life, or a train symbolizes steady progress towards a goal. Cars tend to symbolize daily life and present circumstances. Trains tend to be associated with ideas such as being on the right track or interrelated, or I often say to people, stay on track. Boats tend to symbolize long-term goals and destinations and movement in the soul. Planes, on the other hand, get you to destinations more quickly. Now, what's very important, don't assume that those interpretations are exactly what, if people, you have, you know, are in boats in, in their dreams, are in cars, or on trains. Only they can tell you whether being on track or being off track, right, um, or cars, you know, being on the journey that they're in at the moment. Only they can tell you whether that makes sense. They are the expert. But it's pos there are possibilities. And the action component of a dream is a primary place to focus for seeing the symbolism of the dream, right? And you know, that action focus in my dream of the earthquake going up the mountain, right? And I had a mountain to climb. And that was very much the action, the journey, right? And then the temptation not to continue that journey by going back to the church. And then the dream showing me, no, the church is going to collapse for you. You need to now find your own journey, and then seeing that path up the side of the mountain. So that action part of the dream uh, was very telling. Actions add definition to your dream symbols by showing the meaning. Actions tell the dream story. It moves the plot forward and is found in the verbs you use to describe your dream. You may be running, you may be swimming, you may be hiding, you may be falling, you may be floating, you may be talking, you may be eating. So, for example, flying can symbolize quickly getting to a destination in your life. Hiding can mean, can mean to conceal or avoid. Eating can mean to take something into yourself to digest opinions, beliefs, or knowledge. Be assured that dreams allow the real inner you to show. And I remember the uh, woman come to me a good number of years ago now, and she had a dream. She walks, she goes through these double doors into this very large room. And there are some steps up to the, up to the floor of the room. <clears throat> and up on the steps, her mother and father are standing at the, at the top of the steps. And then she hears a baby roaring, crying on the left of her, and she hears a baby roaring, crying on the right of her. And she's a twin. She would have been in her 30s, in her probably 40s at this stage. And she knows the child on the right is her twin brother, and she knows the child on the left is herself. And she walks past her mother and father, and she goes over to the child on the left, and there's a curtain, the child is, high, is, is behind the curtain. And when she draws back the curtain, this little baby is on a cold slab, slab of stone, naked, and there's a, this black monster over the baby, and the baby is absolutely terrified, right? And she takes up the baby, and she puts the baby inside her coat. And she walks out down the steps, past her mother and father, down onto the street. And as she was going down the street, she hears steps, footsteps coming behind her. And eventually this man comes abreast of her and says, what are you doing? And she turns to the man and says, I'm taking my baby home. And that's been a lifetime project for this woman, right? Because <clears throat> she was totally enslaved. She never married. She was always enslaved to looking after everybody. And the dream, she needs to start at the very beginning. A bit like the man with the truck going back down to the bottom of, of the ravine, right? She needs to start with the baby. She needs to get rebirth herself. 
she needs to take her baby home. It was such a powerful dream. Freud says, the interpretation of dreams is the royal road to knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. And again, Jane mentioned that lovely line at the beginning, a dream which is not interpreted is like a letter which is not read. I love that line. A dream which is not interpreted is like a letter which is not read. And dreams use associations to create symbolism. For example, dogs are commonly associated with friendship. A dream can use a dog to symbolize a specific friend, a friendship, or the subject of friendship. What about a sports car? I get a lot of people who have dreams about their leaving certificate examination. Now, if you take it literally, you think it's about the leaving certificate examination. But of course, the deeper issue, you need to leave the family. You need to fly the nest. And that's one of the most difficult, much more difficult for a lot of people than doing the Lehman certificate examination. And then school, what, what is it that I, I, I need to get to know? The sun, what is the warmth I need to find? The storm, what is the storm inside of me that I need to examine and check what I need to do with it? The earthquake, like my own dream, if you're in a forest. So, they all have symbolic meanings. But the main intention of a dream, I can assure you, is to reveal a truth to you. Some truth about yourself that has lain hidden, maybe for years, right? Um, and so, and when we see the truth and we get the support, then we begin to go that journey of freeing ourselves, begin to see ourselves, maybe for the first time. So we may brainstorm and people bring me a dream. Of course I brainstorm. They're the expert. All of them do look at possibilities. Some of your, my ideas may not resonate, but hitting the mark gives the person a snap of recognition. They say, oh, Tony, that's it. That resonance, right? That, that dings experience, right? After all, they are the author. And it was a, a, a dream I'd like to tell you about. It was a, a, a man and um, let's see now. It's yes. This was the dream he presented. I arrive at a dinner party. There are many people, some I recognize and others I do not know. A long table is set with name tags, but I cannot find my own name. I keep on finding the names of others. When I want to leave, I cannot find my coat. Now, this dream is fairly typical of a person in search of self. The old identity is no longer visible. A new identity has to be found. In the process, the man is unable to find an acceptable setting or the right protection. For example, he can't find his coat. And a coat is both protection and identity. In other words, we say, it's my coat. He is uncomfortable in this new strange place. According to Jung, the most unhel unhelpful thing that one can do at this stage is to take on the first identity available. Or to cling desperately to the old. Be still, wait, and trust the unconscious. In time, it will bring up the response that has been called for. <clears throat> The way to wholeness, Jung said, is made up of many, well, he uses the word wrong turnings. I wouldn't use the word wrong, right? But I would say it is made up of many sidetracks before we're ready to go on the right track. It's a, it, remember, beginning to find your own authority, finding authorship of yourself. Is one of the hardest tasks for us in life, challenging the authority of family, ch challenging the authority of school, of teachers, challenging the authority of the church, challenging the authority of people in the workplace or managers or whatever. It is one of our great challenges, right? But we need a lot of support to do it. But I can assure you dreams will try and bring to consciousness that need to become author of yourself. What the man there in that dream that I read to you at a dinner party, 
what he's typically doing is leaving the moment he feels uncomfortable. He's unable, or so he believes, to stay and face the unknown and unable, it seems, to explore unfamiliar territory. So he's still searching for his identity. He's still searching for that authorship of himself. Very lovely dream. Um, and some wonderful books I recommend for you if you're interested in dreams. The Book of Dreams by Elgin Frank. And that's why I wouldn't feel like writing another book because I found his book excellent. Now, there are several other books, but I found that one the better one. Now, when you, when you look at um, dreams, right? See now, often again. The um, I want to I want to get, I want to bring this dream to you because it's a very fascinating dream. Um, and let me see, can I find it there now? Yes. And it's what I call the sports car dream. And it's a woman. And she says, I'm driving a sports car up a hill. To my left is the ocean. I'm driving faster and faster. Around the bend, the car takes off. I must have fallen out, as in the next scene, I am in the sea on my own. No car to be seen. I am deep out at sea and afraid. There are some people on the shore, but they do not hear my shouts and remain unaware of my frantic waving. I'm afraid that I'm going to drown. I wake up with my fear in my heart, relieved to find myself in my own bed. Now, a good question to ask about that dream. What's the main team in that dream? Or what title would you put on that dream? And what title struck me was placing my own life in danger. And what is she doing in the dream? Well, she's driving too fast, right? And what her other's doing? Well, her shouts for help are not being heard. She is trying her best, but the others are preoccupied and do not notice her distress. And what are her feelings in the dream? Two strong feelings, fear in relation to driving fast, and then extreme loneliness in relation to nearly drowning. And her thoughts in the dream, that she had to drive that fast, that she had no choice. And so <clears throat> this was a dream of a young woman who would go out to bars and pick up on suitable men. Although she described this as harmless fun, sports, one could say, she always ended up feeling nervous and out of sorts. She believed herself to be in charge, being a skilled flirt. And yet, why did she come to see me? The dream tells a different story. Although outwardly, the young woman was charming and in control, the dream was warning of impending danger should she continue to drive too fast. That is, be daring, take risks. The danger could be real or psychological. It doesn't matter. The dream was suggesting strongly that she needed to stop her dangerous game. Otherwise, she would land up in deep waters, far out, too far to be able to reach the safe, grounded energies uh, within herself, too far out to be able to save herself. Very powerful and, and fascinating dream, right? And it brings out clearly, again, all the all the intelligence of the dream and the, and the wisdom of the dream. And in many ways, that dream was, was foretelling the future. If she didn't now mend her ways, if she didn't stop taking these dangerous risks, she was in danger of losing her life. And some dreams definitely foretell the future. And about 10 years ago, um, I was very ill. Um, and I'd lost about three stone in weight. It's coming up around November. Um, and I'm a bit reluctant to go 
to med 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 medics, no, no, uh, no criticism of them, but I just trust that my body or my dreams or my feelings let me know what's going on. But anyway, I'd lost three stone of weight. And at, in, at night in bed, I was getting these rigorous rides. And eventually, I you know, Helen, my wife, right, she said, please, will you go to see a doctor? So I went to a doctor. And it was fascinating. He was on his computer all the time when, I, when he was examining me, or he made no eye contact, made no inquiry about what my life, what's happening in my life. Totally misdiagnosed what was going on, gave me some medication that didn't help at all. And the symptoms continued. And then a very good colleague of mine said his brother was a GP, would I go to see him? So I did. And he had me hospitalized immediately. And when I went to the hospital, they rushed me into um, ICU immediately. They test after test after test. Um, and then <laughs> very sadly told Helen, my wife, right, that I had liver cancer, that I had only a short time to live, and that she would need to kind of get the family together and let them know. Now, it was very fascinating. I was in such a calm place, quite a spiritual place in many ways. And in the private room I was in the hospital, when the care staff would come in or the people bringing the, the meals out of the nurses, they'd come into the room and they'd say, my God, there's something in this room that's so peaceful or whatever. And I was feeling that inside of me. I had no fear. Um, and I had three dreams on the, on the one night, one, the, one dream after the other, quite extraordinary. And the first dream was <clears throat> that, oh, let me just get to remember the dream now in the proper sequence for you. Um, was it again now? Um, Oh, yes, yes, I beg your pardon. I'm at an airport and I'm rushing to catch a flight. And my secretary is supposed to be there to meet me with my briefcase. And I'm looking all over the place. And then I go down these very high stone steps, right? And there's no guardrail down these steps. And as I'm going down, I'm looking around to see, can I see my secretary? And what, what happens, a little four-year-old is running up the steps. He bounces off my legs, goes tumbling over the side of the steps. I see his head hitting the ground, and I know that he's dead. First dream. Second dream, immediately. I'm down the back, old back streets in Cork, the old cobble streets in Cork. And just going down the street, and narrow streets. And I came to where there was a wall, the wall, the street was walled off, it was about over 20 foot in high, it was flat, you couldn't scale it, and I'm wondering, there's no way back now in the dream, I need to go forward. And I'm wondering, what am I going to do? How, what, what will I do now? And in the dream, I put my hands up like that, and if I do, I float up over the wall, and I get to the other side. And then the third dream, immediately after that one, I'm at some function um, years later, and this woman comes over to me and she said, oh, aren't you Tony Humphreys? And I said, yeah, that's me. Sure, you've been in your late 80s now, wouldn't you? I said, yeah, that's, that's true. She said, you're looking great for your age, you know. But you know, she said, what would help now is a bit of lipstick. Wow. Now, what was the first, the first dream was telling me, I was back, no guard, rail. I was not looking out for myself. My little four-year-old child, the four-year-old was me because I was the one who looked out for everybody as a child. I was back doing that again. Many things had happened in my life at the time. And the dream was saying to me, Tony, you're in danger now of killing yourself. The second dream, though, was prophetic. It was saying, okay, you've hit a wall, Tony but you're going to come through it. You're going to get over to the other side. And then the third dream shows I do get over to the other side. 
I know my lady, she's looking well. And this woman comes over to me and she said, you're looking great, but you know now, put your lipstick, it, it, it would help. And of course, lipstick, what symbolically was that saying? And of course, what the lipstick was saying, what you do with your lips, you speak. And I needed to stick to my word of be sure I'm safeguarding myself, be sure I'm looking out for myself, be sure I have clear boundaries, that I'm not losing myself like I did, like the little four-year-old who had to in order to survive. Three amazing dreams, and they brought such peace to me, and, and, and I knew I was going to come through um, whatever was happening in my body. And very fortunately, the, um, the man who did the ultrasound um, on, on all the tests that were done, he spotted right that there was an abscess in my liver from um, infections in the gallbladder. And he very kindly himself put in a drain to drain off the abscess. But if he did, my body, my body went back into uh, rigors. And then the two consultants that were involved in my case, they rushed me down to the ICU uh, from the private room. They had all the monitors up and, on and, on and I was there. But I was so calm and I was just sending energy down to that area of my body, you know, around the gallbladder, around the liver. And it was amazing that both consultants were saying they could see me doing it. They said, look what he's doing, look what he's doing, look what he's doing. Uh, we have much more power than we realize. And I recovered very well. Um, and it was fascinating. About after three weeks or so, they asked me, would I go back and just have the CAT scans redone and so on? And I did. And very interesting, the radiologist especially came over to me and she said, she said, Tony, I can't believe I'm looking at the same body. So we have such healing powers. And the, one of the consultants wanted to say, well, you know now there were gallstones there, we need to remove your gallbladder. And I said, no way, I don't have any symptoms. And over 10 years later, I've had no symptoms. So what a friend those three dreams were for me, right? And the realizations in them and the whole spiritual thing of rising above them, right? Um, and, it, you know, when I was down the back streets in Cork, so that was, again, being back to the old times, right? Back again to the, when I was a child, right? And hitting the walls that I hit then. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. The, um, <clears throat> yeah. There's another wonderful dream I'd like to tell you about. Let's see now, can I find it for you? Yes. It's... It's what I call Irene's dream, right? And um, she says, mm, I'm walking down the road and come across upon two turtles fighting. I stop to watch and discover that one of them and discover that one of them is my pet turtle. I walk on I find, and I find that my pet turtle has one of my fingers in his mouth and is hanging on as I walk. It, this is uncomfortable, and I complain about it. Suddenly, I find that instead of the turtle, a bag of lotion is around my finger. It feels much better. I continue my walk and come upon my pet turtle again. This time, it's on its back, feet kicking in the air. Concerned, I start to turn it over, and a voice says, no, leave it alone. That's a very important lesson to learn. Clear as mud? Yeah, right. <laughs> now, the important thing there is, right? I was asking the person, right? Well, what, what do the various parts of the dream represent for you, right? The road, the way you travel, the turtle, something with a hard protective shell. The fighting, conflict. The turtle pet, pet favorite. The fingers for feeling, for doing everything really. This is a woman's now response to each of the parts of her dream. The lotion, oh, it softens, right? The turtle on his back, vulnerable and exposed. And then the voice that said, 
you know, leave it, you know, what was it, how to put it? No, leave it alone. That's a very important lesson to learn. And it was very interesting. Um, yeah. The, not only did, you know, Irene confirm the, inter the interpretation verbally, but she also reported feeling a ding, right? That, that resonance, an important body reaction, like the proverbial light bulb, that almost always occurs when the translation is on target. It's that eureka moment that many people feel when they've hit the meaning of a dream. Something resonates inside them and it's experienced as a physical sensation. So much so, others can almost see the light bulb that's gone off in your head. So, I mean, the, 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 I mean, they're fascinating to work with dreams, right? Because of the creativity of them, because of the magic of them, um, and because there's such a soul presence in those dreams, right? Um, and I'm going to finish with one more dream for you. Um, let's see now, can I find it? Um, yes. And yeah. I'm alone at home, not my current house, but one from several years ago. It's night, and I'm in bed asleep when a noise rouses me. I awake to discover an intruder, a tall, dark man, and I know he's come to loot the house. I don't feel personally threatened, and I don't care so much about his taking the TV or silver, but I don't want to lose the information on my computer. Knowing that I need help, I run out the front door and try to yell for help. But my throat seems closed and no sound comes out. I keep trying to yell, help, help, until I finally am able to get the words out. Now yelling loudly, I run to a neighbor's house, bang on the door and ring the doorbell. But this time, all my neighbors are gathering outside by this time, all my neighbors are gathering outside and coming to my rescue. I feel relieved. So you might say that this dream represents in a time of need, a woman, this woman has difficulty calling for help. When she does, people come to her aid. Did you get that? What this is, yelling for help dream is telling Frida. It's, help, it's helpful to know that she's a very independent type, super confident and efficient, who hates to ask anyone for assistance. Notice how hard it was for her to yell for help. Now we have it in a nutshell, what the message of her dream is saying. The message of Frida's dream might be that when a person needs help, she needs to ask for it, no matter how difficult it might be. This is a lesson to be learned, the behavior and attitude that she needs support to work on. As it happened, not long after the dream, she found herself overloaded and overwhelmed with work for a volunteer organization. Recalling her dream, she asked for help from several people in the organization. They all gladly pitched in to help. And again, can see the prophetic nature of that dream. It's like it was seeing ahead. So, <laughs> dreams, you know, they're, uh, I'm always fascinated by them. Um, and I never tire of listening to the absolute creativity of them um, and ingenuity of them and the possibilities that they present, right? And, you know, a good idea that if you're interested in exploring your dreams, you just have a notebook next to your bed. And that's when you, if you wake up during the middle of the night and you've just come out of a dream, write it down. Or when you wake up the following morning, write as much of your dream down. Um, because remember, there are messages from the soul, there are messages from the unconscious trying to draw attention, 
to bring to consciousness what may have lain hidden, as we saw from some of the stories I've told you, and, and particularly from my own stories as well, lain hidden from early childhood. So, <clears throat> you know, we, un we unconsciously dismiss dreams, the ongoing commentary offered by the self as to just how things are going and how they might be better. We unconsciously ignore our story with revelations of how and why we live unlived lives. And the dreams are the calls to live your own life fully and soulfully. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a few questions here. Oh, good. And um, can you put that book up again? Um, we didn't catch the author. It wasn't Tony Humphreys, no. No. What's it's the name of the author? Elgin Frank. Who? Sorry? Elgin, E L G A N. Frank, okay. Frank, okay. F R A N K. Yeah. Okay. The best one I've heard. I had several books in reading, but I found his the best. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can turn, if people have got a question they want to ask with their microphones, I can turn on their mic. Um, this is from Katrina, and I'll, I, if you want to say more about it, Katrina, I can turn on your mic in a bit. She says, I had just started an ancestral healing course mm. and had a dream about visiting my granny, who has been dead for over 30 years. Right. There was no front door on her house, and I was concerned for her safety and security. Mm. She told me not to worry that, that she is and would be okay. A few weeks later, in real life, I was leaving my house and the back door came away from the frame in my hand. Mm. I felt panicky. And when I phoned the company who installed the door, they said they had never seen anything like it. They could not explain it. Wow. wow. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering, you know, you know, it was her granny, but her granny symbolizes the old part of herself, the early part of her own life, possibly, about the things she needs to discover about herself that are back there, there and the door needs to be broken open to, to get to, to see what, what needs to be looked at. Now, that's a guess on my part. I'd love to have a more in-depth conversation with Katrina, right? But they are the possibilities. If you take it literally, you think it's your granny. If you take it symbolically, your granny represents early parts of your story, all the parts of your story, right? That's a possibility, right? And then things that need to be discovered. Okay. Um, I have a couple of hands raised here. So I could, wait a minute now. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get to those because I think people might want to ask a question. What's this one from Morgana to everyone, right? If we have a dream, we'd like to explore with Tony. Oh, it's gone, right? Sorry, Morgana. Oh, okay, you got it, have you? No, it's gone, it, it disappeared. If we have a dream we'd like to explore with Tony, would he be open uh, to having a session with us? I'm a past pupil of his. Yeah, of course I remember Morgana. Oh, yes, yeah. I would be. Time is, and it would need to be face to face, right? Um, and and he says, if, if certain dreams simply operate as wish fulfillments, but are analyzed with the preceding belief that there is a deeper message for us to learn about ourselves, do we run the risk of misunderstanding or projecting meaning upon the dream? Thanks. I think if the dreams are purely wish fulfillment, right? Um, and it's important to see what are the wishes I want to fulfill, then deeper interpretations, they won't resonate for you. So you, you won't feel, no, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't resonate for me, Tony, right? Where if you, if, if what resonates for you, yeah, there are things I want to fulfill in my life that the dreams are drawing my attention to. Well, let's go for that. Um, if anybody wants me to un ask a question with their mics, they could um, just perhaps put that in the chat box and I'll, I'll unmute them. Um, Kira says, what would you say to someone who is, oh no, there's one, actually there's one before that from Aoife. I dreamt of a puma chasing a deer. My husband had, uh, had rescued the deer and then the puma started chasing us. We barricaded ourselves in the bathroom. 
Mm. So it, it was, and the puma, you know, chasing the deer, right? Which is a, I would want to know for a deer for her, what would it mean? Was it her deer self? Right. Because if we take it literally, I think it's just the deer, right? What does the puma then represent? Is it the kind of the, the danger that is there, the danger of being eaten alive? Um, so give me the rest of that and the puma. Well, my husband rescued the deer and then the puma started chasing us. The puma yeah. started chasing us. Yeah. We barricaded ourselves in right. the bathroom. Okay. Okay. And so that her, her husband rescuing the deer, right? Um, that when somebody else does it for you, right? You're still, on, you're still at risk, right? You need to actually find a way to take care of yourself, to deal with the puma yourself. And sometimes we do look to the other to do it for us, but actually that won't solve the deeper issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Kira says, what would you say to someone who is young, very happy and carefree life and trauma free, but only has bad nightmares, a lot of being hunted, chased, running most nights. Yeah, so I'm wondering if, if she's always, you know, we, we, everybody suffers, right? I don't know anybody who doesn't suffer, but if I'm always, you know, positive and happy and carefree, whatever, is it that I found a way not to look at how I was hunted or how I was criticized or how I was abandoned? Is that my way of not looking at that pain? Because it's very wise. And that's not uncommon, right? So, um, so we, we find, you know, keeping it, you know, putting, and we even use the phrase, putting on a happy face, right? Mm -hmm. um, but really, be, the happy face is hiding deep unhappiness. So I'd be curious about that person's life uh, from the beginning, whether it was all, you know, carefree, happy, whatever. I suspect because of the nightmares that it wouldn't have been. But that's a guess. Um, there's a question. Um, does sex in dreams always mean sex or does it speak of other issues? It, it, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, again, if you take sex literally, then you think it's just about sex, but generally it more than likely represents intimacy, closeness, coming together, right? Being at one with yourself, right? Not with another, but with yourself. But again, I need to know the particular details, but try not to take anything literally in a dream. Always try to see what could the deeper symbolic meaning of sex mean for me in the dream? And it could be intimacy, right? Um, Mary wants to ask you a question. I'm just going to, um, Mary, are you on the list as just Mary, I wonder? I'm going to allow Mary to talk. Mary, did you have a question? Um, oh. It was Mary Leahy, uh, and I see- oh, Okay. To... Am I uh, mute, sir? Maybe? Is no, you're not needed. no, I was just trying to find Mary Lee. Oh, okay. Um, Mary, answer live. I can't see you on the list, Mary. Who did you um, book under? I've got a, I've got a, a Mary there, but she's not answering. So that's a very difficult one to, that's a difficult one to, um, to get. I'll just ask her to uh, to raise her hand again. There's a Mary Lee who might be there. Mary Lee said she'd like to talk about a dream, uh, yeah. but she wanted me to un undo her mic, and I um, I don't I, I cannot see her name on the list is the problem. Okay. So does anybody? Oh, there she is. There, allowed to talk. There she is. Hi, Mary. Hi, Jane. Hi. Hi, Tony. Hi, Mary. Heather, how are you? Hi, good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a wave. Tony, I had a dream um, the other morning, and um, in the dream, um, I, 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 I don't know how it happened, but I was climbing a rock, 
and the water was getting higher and higher and I had to pull myself up. Right. And I, I was shocked. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe it that I was able to pull myself up. But I was I pulled myself up hmm. and I saved myself Good. and I couldn't believe that I had done it. And I was now at the top of the rock and the water was getting <laughs> higher. And I was so delighted with myself that I first of all, that I was able to pull myself up and then that I actually saved myself. Yeah. And then I just looked back and um, I, ha I have my um, I have my dad's car. Um, he would have been 77 this week, but um, his car is 2005 and I can't let it go. My mother gave me his car when he died. But like the water kept going higher over the car and I was saved, but the car, the car was leaving me. It was, it was going. Right. Yeah. So, so that was it. It was over, but I never dreamed, but it was, it was a very strong dream. Very powerful dream, Mary. Very powerful. And it shows how much that, you know, your life, you've been, you know, I know your story fairly well. So you've come in from a place where you were nearly drowning for lots of your life and on a very rocky road all the time. Yeah. But you are pulling yourself out, there's no doubt about that, and you are beginning to save yourself. Yeah. Yeah, and your father's car, you know, where the war takes over that, <clears throat> you know that you need to now focus on your life. You need to remember, we need to leave the nest, we need to become our own person. Yeah. And holding on to your father, right, is then means you're not holding yourself, right? And the dream is saying to you, you need to let go of your father now. Yes, yeah. And you need to find your own car, yes. drive your own life, not your father's life. Yes, yeah. Like the car is going to go anyways. It's not going to last. Well, like, not bad. 2005, you did well. Yeah, it's a Yaris. Yeah. yeah, I hear you got a new electric car, so they look at it. Yeah, so thanks. That means okay, so it's powerful. Mary. So it means I'm getting stronger, is it? And stronger, and it's, it's really letting you know clearly you need to now focus entirely on your life you're in a place you can do it now yeah and let go of your father yeah thanks to you and helen tony thanks a million love the talk thank you okay mary thank you thanks um, thanks mary uh, a question from kathy um do kittens represent anything in particular not full-grown cats but kittens well, again, I'd, I'd have to explore with the person, but they're, they're, the kittens are, you know, they're young ones, or they're, 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 they're like newborns, right? And it could mean, you know, it could also mean kittens are very playful as well. It could be that they, they, they play very much, but I'd need to know what the part that the kittens played in a dream, right? And I'd have some sense on what kittens might mean. But it could be around play. It could be around early life, very like, you know, toddlers are great players, right? And they love to play, they love to explore, and so do kittens, right? So it could symbolize the younger parts of your life. Um, but that's again only a guess. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is an interesting question about colors. Um, <clears throat> from Neve. I was wondering, do colors have significance in dreams? A lot of my dreams tend to be in grayish dark hues but I had yeah. one recently where someone was being murdered and the colors were extremely bright and exaggerated yeah yeah and the colors uh, obviously colors are so symbolic on the black dark right gray you now we talk about a gray day or kind of um always talk about feeling blue or feeling dark or dark thoughts are coming to our minds right and then um, what, what, what was the end part there of the dream about the... Um, a lot of my dreams tend to be in greyish dark hues, but I had one recently where someone was being murdered and the colours yeah. were extremely bright and exaggerated. Yeah, yeah, and when somebody's being murdered, right, <clears throat> well, it, you know, it needs to be seen, it needs to be glaringly seen. And and what, how is it that, in what way was she being murdered? Because if somebody's been murdered in her dream, she's the one who's been murdered, right? And she near, needs to glaringly see that reality. And, and am I seeing now that there's something in my life where I have been murdered and I need to, well, I need to come alive to that and come alive to myself. 
Now, again, as I said, I'd love to have a much longer conversation with somebody around the dream, but that's a poss possibility. Okay. Um, my son had, has had some great dreams, especially about members of his family that have died, especially his father. He is mm. 12. How is the best way to support him with them, with these dreams? And, and the best way is to listen, listen to him, right? Remember, he's the creator of his dreams and thank him for telling you about his dreams and then ask him directly, what do you think that dream means for you now? Remember, he's created it. And very often he may then tell you the feelings around maybe missing his father, you know, the sadness, whatever is going on for him. But try not to interpret his dreams for him, right? Just say, well, you, you're the one who created those amazing dreams, right? And what do you feel that dream about your dad means or whatever else happens in the dream? What do you feel it means? So draw them out rather than giving answers. Yeah. Okay. Um, last night I had a dream of a plane crash in the sea with so many children in it and I had to save them all. Mm. Yeah. So what's playing then? Is there, some, is there something saying, that, do you always save everybody else? Are you the rescuer of everybody else? Is that the plain thing that you, you need to see? And where are you if you're always rescuing somebody else? Now again, you see, if I knew a lot more of the story, I might have a better sense of what that dream is trying to communicate, but that's one possibility. <clears throat> so, and certainly that would have been my life rescuing everybody for years, right? Um, and, you know, not, not saving myself. And that took a while for it to, for that plane to be seen, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what I was flying on, yeah. yeah. Um, can, talk, can Tony talk a little about lucid dreams and how to handle Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, lucid dreams are quite rare, and that's why I didn't talk about them. And they're, they're quite extraordinary because in a lucid dream, you actually can change a dream when you're in it. It's like you're, you're dreaming, but you're also an active person in the dream and you can make adjustments in the dream or do things in the dream. Um, but they're quite rare. They're very powerful when they occur. Um, but I deliberately didn't talk about them because they're so rare. But um, our friend Elgin Frank talks about them. Yeah, in his book, yeah. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, I have a recurring symbol in my dreams of white sheets or white paper. Any mm. idea what this means? Well, do you whitewash things? <laughs> you know, do, do, you, do you camouflage things? Do you cover over the things that you need to see? The dark side or the, you know, the, the nasty things can happen or the dirty things that can happen, right? Or the foul things that can happen. Now that's a guess again, but somehow we do whitewash. We do put a, a sheet over what is too frightening or too painful to see. That's a possibility, yeah. Shall I ask Elizabeth uh, if she wants to talk about that? Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, I'm allowing you to talk if you want to say something more about the whitewash. Hi, hi, Tony, it's Liz here. Oh, Pardon Liz, hi there, how are you? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I, I have a recurring dream most, most nights where there's something white in it, but I suppose um, the most uh, recent one was I was in uh, the west of Ireland and um, I was in sort of my mum's house and I looked out the window, I was getting ready to go for a swim and um, a, a man came up, a foreign man came up the driveway and he was looking to go for a swim as well. And um, it was a busy weekend in the house and there was, I was talking to my sister as I could see him coming up the driveway about towels and if there was enough towels for uh, everybody to have their swim. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this kind of lush, fluffy towel on, a, on the line and I thought, I'm taking that towel for me. And I, I, I get the towel and I hide it away somewhere so that I have a towel for myself. Um, so that, that was kind of part of the dream. Mm. So, you need to, so it was a busy weekend, lots of family there. Yeah. And this foreign man coming up, right? And he's looking to go swimming, right? Yeah. 
And, you know, what's foreign for you is what? Uh, foreign, uh, lots of different things. I, um, putting, your own, putting your own needs first? Yeah, probably yeah. putting my own needs first. It, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and then you had to do it and you, you saw this nice fluffy towel, but you did it secretly, you put it away secretly for yourself. Yeah. You weren't able to declare, I'm going to take that towel, right? So it's foreign for you to actually go after what you want for yourself. Yes, that would actually make sense, yeah. So okay. the whitewashing then is covering over what I want to do for myself. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, very much. And we do a white we do whitewash, don't we? Things that we don't want to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Tony. That was great. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, Peggy, do you have a question? I'll uh, I'll turn your your mic on. Peggy, you had your hand raised. No. Peggy, are you there? Okay. Okay. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, we can oh. hear you. Hi, Peggy. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much. I enjoyed your talk so 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 much. Oh, thank um, you. I love. I love dreams and um, I know when I have a dream that's telling me something, I wake up immediately and I know the meaning. But what I do dream of a lot are people that have died. Okay. I'm, I'm down here in Cape Clear at the moment where I'm from, uh, cocooning. And um, the other night I had a dream. I met this man on the road. It's a very quiet road. And um, he had a very frilly white shirt with fresh blood stains and a bottle of alcohol in his hand. Right. And I, I was in a Jeep and he walked up uh, to speak. And I said to him, oh, you must mind yourself. And I said to myself, I know who he is. He's a priest who used to live here a long time ago. Right. And <clears throat> perhaps alcohol was an issue. I wouldn't be 100 percent sure. So uh, and so he just passed on and then I, I drove on and I saw a lot of alcohol in containers at the end of the road. It was blocking the road okay. and then I woke up mm. and then I woke up. So I feel some of those dreams are about maybe souls on the other side that haven't maybe passed on. I don't know, because I do dream of a lot of people that left this earth maybe in not a good place yeah. and I pray for them. And tell me, how well do you occupy this earth yourself? How well do I occupy what? This, this earth. earth. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, well, now I'm a great for meditating. I know you, Tony. I went to you many, many, many years ago. Okay. I meditate morning and evening. I would be very strong in my spirituality. It means so much to me. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, and, and I'm, I have an awareness. I feel I'm connect, I'm very connected. Oh, yeah. that sounds, uh, and and do, you, do you feel that, you know, I hear about your spirituality, which is wonderful, but also do you feel you live your life fully? Uh, well, I suppose now that we're restricted here on Cape Clear, mm. um, the, the, it's been a long winter. Now, I don't complain because I have so much to be grateful for. So oh, okay. I go walking a lot. And um, but I suppose there's a, a certain mundane feeling to life at the moment because of restriction. Right. But yeah. yeah, I don't associate that with the dream, though. I don't know. Hmm. And when you say you don't complain. Oh, I, mean I, I when I say I don't complain is that I am I'm very grateful uh, gratitude would be to me gratitude is the soul speaking really I, I look around at nature I adore it uh, the sea is at my doorstep uh, it is incredible uh, all my ancestors came from here I feel like I connect with them mm. um, um, and and so no I'm I'm very happy in my life really I have grandchildren. I have a husband. You connect deeply with yourself? I do, yeah. I, I, I sense I do. Uh, most definitely. Yes. Yeah, I do. And I follow, you know, I, I, 
I love herbalism and I love good food and natural food. And I feel I'm addressing every aspect of myself, my whole self, as it were, my body, my mind and my spirit. OK, good. So you have really sense of your presence then? Yeah, I have, really. But it's just it's just I've always been a dreamer of people that have passed, funnily, and they are people that aren't happy. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, I'd like to talk a lot more with you about it, because I'm wondering what the purpose of that dream is, that people who have passed who weren't happy. And, yeah. and I suppose that, the possibility, is there things, unhappy things in your own life and probably your own childhood, right? That still need attending. I suppose what I would say to that is, of course, oh, okay. uh, I would, yeah, of course, I, I am conscious of, um, I, I would be conscious of certain things uh, and I'm, I'm conscious of working on them and oh, working with good. them. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah because um, I think that's what the dreams are trying to draw attention because, you know, we all got hurt in childhood. Yeah. Parents did their best, right? Remember when we talked? Yeah. I never, I don't have any ill feeling towards my parents at all. My heart goes out to them because they had such unlived lives, right? That's the truth, yeah. Um, but then what, their unlived lives impacted on our lives. And for us then to fully live our lives, it's a long journey. And I love the line, the longest and most exciting journey is the journey inwards. But it's the, longest, it's the longest journey. Yes. And I think your dreams may be drawing attention Stay on that journey. Yes, 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 yes. It's wonderful. Listen, you're great. And thank you, Jane, so much thank as well. You. Thanks, thank Peggy. Peggy. Thank you. God thank bless. You. Thank you. Bye. Um, Tracy asks, I, I have a recurring dream where I'm packing for a long trip. However, I can't fit everything in the suitcase right. or I can't find things that I'm meant to put in. Mm. <laughs> so, and then and, and the journey is a journey in words. And there are a lot, there's a lot of things that need to be packed in that journey because we there is so much, you know, that so much hurts that we experience, right? And to go on the journey inwards, oh, there's, there's a lot of baggage to be dealt with, right? We talk about that, don't we? Emotional baggage. <clears throat> and some can be very, very heavy and very big baggage, right? And it, again, it's a guess. It may well be that's what the dream is trying to draw attention to, the emotional baggage and, and the, the extent of it that she needs. If she's going to travel this journey, she needs the consciousness. There's a lot of baggage to be dealt with, right, and carried. But again, that's a guess. Um, uh, Catherine, Catherine says she dreamt of having a, a very long, meaningful conversation with her sister-in-law on the phone. Yeah. And the conversation was about? Let, let, let me find Catherine. Um, Catherine, are you there, Catherine? Wait a minute. Catherine. Sorry, I'm just a bit slow on this. Oh, I think she's gone. Catherine, is it? Um, I think we'll go on to something else and then I can come back to Catherine. Now what I might just say in answer yeah. to that, right? That the long, the very long conversation on the phone with her sister in law. Yeah. Um, what I would be saying to her, obviously, she needs to have a very long conversation with herself. And I'd be curious to know what does her sister in law or who does a sister-in-law sister symbolize for her? Mm. Yeah. yeah, that could be an interesting question to ask. Okay, yeah. Okay, wait a minute. I'm just, there are a couple of raised hands here, Tony. Um, and there's quite a lot of people. Oh, there she is, Catherine. Uh, you can talk, Catherine. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Catherine, hi there, hi. Yeah. Hi. yeah um, I just had a, a, I don't know what the conversation was about, but it just, I remember dreaming um, about having a long conversation with her. 
she's uh, I wouldn't she wouldn't be we wouldn't be that close yeah, yeah. you know we yeah. we hardly ever okay we'd ever, we'd ever talk we hardly ever talk really so what I suspect then Catherine that the dream is trying to draw attention to the long conversation that you need to have with the part of yourself that doesn't know you very well okay all right that makes sense yeah that's true that's true oh, okay thanks thanks tony Th thanks catherine thank you um tony we have a few more questions here um i had a dream that a man gave a person beside me his face to shred then i was cutting the face with the scissors the nose was grisly and the scissors faltered and i woke up what mm. might it mean i need to resolve issues with my employer okay so i what i'd be interested and this again uh, thanks for the the dream my guess is what is it that he needs to face right in terms of whether it's employer or within himself that you know that he's quite caught up about that he's in, uh, kind of shreds about what is it that he needs to face in himself and then outside himself so it's quite a powerful dream yeah very powerful yeah quite frightening well it's, it's again it's creative it, it, it it's its purpose is very clear it is strongly trying to bring a message to this man right yeah okay um Elaine dreams about volcanic eruptions from flat countryside and tornadoes, but mm. she felt no fear or no damage, caused, no damage was caused. So she dreams of uh, eruptions on the, on the, yeah, on the flat, flat surface. Countryside. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And, and tornadoes, but she right. felt no fear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just wondering, what were the eruptions that happened in her life? What, what were the stormy things, the tornadoes that happened in her life, right? Um, has she flattened them in some way or other, rather than really exploring their impact on her? Um, and, you know, we're having no fear. Um, is it then that somehow I found a way not to look at them? I'd need to know a lot more of her story, but that's put some possibilities. I'm interested in the flattened surface. I'm sorry. Elaine, certainly... Elaine yeah. I can allow you to talk if you're there. Yeah, hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, hi, thank you. Really, really good talk. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks, um, Elaine. Thank uh, I dream very vividly. Um, and over this last year in particular, um, and the dreams, it's like in my dreams, I'm with somebody else and they don't seem to see the potential change that's gonna happen. So in the case of the, I'm standing with my husband and I'm looking out at countryside and it's just beautiful Irish countryside. Right. And I say to him, something's going to happen. Right. And then lava just comes straight up, but it goes straight up to the sky and instead right. of it destroying things, it comes straight back down. So it doesn't, oh. and I'm just looking at it going, it's amazing. And then I switch to the tornado and it only looks like wisps of straw. And my mm -hmm. daughter is beside me. And, and then I say to her, actually, it's a tornado. And we're in a different country. And the natives of the country, they just move to the side and they, they don't feel any fear. And I move to the other side of the road and I say, we need to move upwind and then we're fine. We're safe. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, that's the, um, yeah, that's the dream. Yeah. I mean, lots, lots of that. And, you know, the, it's interesting, like I talked about the flat surface um, the eruption, right. Um, the tornadoes. Right? And if you kind of just look at your life, were there a lot of disruptions um storm stormy times in your life that you feel yes. need to be yes and they need to be addressed not to be ignored not to be allowed to go back underground again there would have been but i would have thought that i had explored them almost ad nauseum do you know what i mean almost to the point that you know do do i have to look at it again it's it's well, you know I 
Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose the important thing why I would be interested in Elaine, you know, if great that you have examined them, but have you come to a peaceful place within yourself, right? Um, a place of kind of oneness with yourself, a, a place of solidity, independence, your own author of your own life, right? Because it's a long journey, right? And if yeah. there were lots of disruptions and tornadoes in your life, I think we underestimate how long that journey takes. That that resonates because Does I'm it? actually at the point. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because I I feel that I need to change, make changes in my life. Okay. And actually, and actually own who I am as distinct from who I've been to date. Oh wow. I've played my roles to date. Good for you. And there's, there's sort of a sense of. I need to be, but I think when I say there's no fear in the dream as I'm speaking now, yeah. I feel a sense of actually a bit of anticipation, but also fear about what might come. Yes. But I think I can do it. But I think I can do it. But of I'm course not you sure. Can. <laughs> I'm not <Yeah>. sure how. <laughs> well, I mean, if you need some support, then if you want me to recommend somebody, um, you can. You, you can get my number quite easily on, on the internet, right? Okay, yes, yeah. thank you very much. Um, yeah, much appreciated. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a real opportunity, Elaine, right? So I would seize, yeah. I would seize that dream, right? <laughs> yes, so, okay. thank you. Thanks, thank you very Elaine. much. Thank, You're welcome. thank you. Thank Take you very much. Bye. There are quite a few plane crash type dreams, um, disaster type dreams being described here, Tony. Yeah. Um, this person is dreaming they were watching a craft like the Concorde or Space Shuttle from behind a wall with a space to look through. Mm. I was being afraid for the people on board. It was upright like the Space Shuttle and when it took off it swooped back down and I was terrified it would crash into the ground in front of us. But yeah. just as I thought this, it swooped back upwards. Mm. That's not an actual crash one, though there are a, a few well, crash it, it, ones. Yeah. Mm. But there is impending danger there, isn't there, in that dream? And what are the impending dangers? That somehow he's hiding behind a wall and just looking out through a, a kind of a, a window or whatever. What are the impending dangers he may need to begin to look at that could happen? Yeah, and not be hiding from them, but find the support now to deal with them straight on right mm -hmm. yeah no yeah. again i guess yeah. okay um the other plane crash type one was um well this is a um a, a recurring dream of a large sea wave over my head about to engulf me there's a glass wall between me and the sea i look up at the peak of the wave and it's frightening Mm -hmm. So it's, it's again, yeah, the wave, right? You can be swept away by a wave, right? Yeah. And there's only he's only, he's behind a glass. That's Anne, yeah. Yeah, Anne, right? And she and um, and the fear of being swept away, and other things that uh, that she's in danger of being swept away by. But she's being protected by a glass wall between her and the sea. Yeah. <clears throat> but how to put it the glass wall right is at least she's seeing the wave coming right um, but I if I'm if I'm protected right I'm still hiding from the wave I'm not diving into it and seeing what is it now that I need to deal with what's the wave that is is that trying to sweep me away I want to be in charge right and so it's good that she's seeing it, but then she also needs to face it rather than hiding behind the glass wall. And she needs support to do that then. Yeah. Yeah. And the low flying planes um, keep having regular dreams, all these low flying planes crashing, but I would be on the ground looking up at them and not a passenger on the ground. Yeah. And how much do you take off yourself? How much do you fly your own flight path, your own life, right? Are you always flying low, not going too high, right? Being careful, right? That's a possibility. 
but it's something about how you're living your life, how you're journeying your life. And it, it, like low flying, I'm not really going up high, am I? I'm just playing it careful, right? That's a possibility. Um, N Chambers wants to ask a question. I've just unmuted you. Hi. Hi. And hi there. It's Geraldine, actually, Tony. Oh, and Geraldine, oh my God. Oh, you're, you're, you're alias tonight, are you? What's that? Alias Anne, is it? Alias N, N Chambers. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Deep laptop, so that's so I'm just using it. Hi, Jane, how are you? Hi. Um, Tony, yes, this dream that's still in my head, or that's still very clear, but I'm not really getting any um, answers with it for myself. In um, the, I've been swept again like that. It, with, it was like after a, a tsunami or a huge big wave, and now it's it's all going out to sea, and I'm being, being taken along with it. Mm -hmm. the, the black rock in the middle of it, and I'm clinging onto that, and then I right. look to the left. And there are streets and houses, and that's all flooded. Now the water is quite calm. Right. And there is a black, there's like it's like a silhouette or a, a shape of a man in black, everything black with a black hat on. I am I could it's just like a silhouette. I'm thinking it's a man. Um, and I'm just clinging on to this black, it's like a it's like a rock. Um, I'm holding on to it. I don't feel too nervous. And, mm. I'm, and I'm looking over at him to my left. Right. And I'm water along the streets, along the left-hand side with the houses. And the houses are quite small with like small windows in them. Right. They're like, they're like townhouses. For the mm. of, of, yeah, uh, I need you to teach me how to do it. Was that Liz? Yeah. What's that? Have you gone? No, I'm here. Uh, Jer, hi. Yeah. I think we've got somebody else's voice coming in. There. Yeah, Liz's voice came in there for some reason. Yeah. Okay. Jer, I'll come back to you there. Yeah. Hi. The um, I mean, there's a lot going on in that dream. Um, you're still being flooded. There's no doubt about that. But you are finding some some ground on that rock. You you and you're beginning to see things more clearly. But there's more water to be dealt with, more kind of uh, flooding to be dealt with, mm. and more expanding of the, the small houses, representing again, you know, the inner house of yourself and the need to expand out your own inner house, your own inner home. Yes, yes. That makes sense? It does, yeah. And then when I look ahead, the water is really wide. But it's it's like that the it's like the end of the wave is now being is now going out to sea as such. Okay, so so you are finding some calm, right? And um, you're see, yeah, you're seeing the it's like you're seeing the wider picture. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That makes sense now. That's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Um, Ellen asks, can you talk about archetypes in dreams? Um, I'd have to think about that one really. I'd have to have read up on it just to be, give her enough, a strong enough answer on it. Okay. Um, but she does it, if you Google on it, she'll get an answer on that. That's very young, Ian, right? I'm not that much into archetypes, to be honest, right? So. But certainly it would be good if she just did a Google on young and the archetypes. She, she would get a, a good explanation on that. Okay. Well, thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, this person has a repetitive dream of being in government, delighted with myself. I think I'm doing a great job and making a difference. But I'm seeing and being criticized at every turn by my actual current boss. Work is difficult at the moment. Mm. So the dream is that she thinks she's doing a great job and making a difference, but uh, but I'm seeing and being criticised at every turn by in her actual current boss. Yeah, yeah, and, and the thing is, her gaze is still on um, her boss, her her current boss is seeing her, and what the dream is saying, she needs to find governorship of herself. That's what I figure what she's probably saying. Yeah, and we talked about that during the thing. We need to become authors of ourselves. Authority means authorship of self. 
but somehow her eyes are still on the authority out there. And that may go right back to childhood, whether in schools or home, right? The authority of parents, the authority of teachers and so on. So it's a real wake up dream, trying her own governorship now, mm. bit by bit, step by yeah. step. Um, another anonymous one, <clears throat> excuse me. I dreamt I was putting out a bowl of wheat a bit, but when I poured the milk in, some went into the box and made the last few biscuits soggy. I decided to throw them out without my husband seeing, because he would have been giving out about waste. Mm -hmm. what. <laughs> <laughs> waste not one. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know. It's again, what is it that, she, you know, it's a waste when she doesn't talk out clearly about what happens for her and being able to express it openly, right? That's the true waste, right? Um, and again, it's a bit like the last question. Her, her gaze is on how her husband is going to be rather than being true to herself. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how we work things out in our dreams. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I often had dreams about um, flying, and I always loved flying in my dreams. And I could always get out of situations by just flying. If I was in a tight spot, I would always be able to fly and get away. It was always wonderful. Yeah, but you're taking off there, is it? Yeah. Rather than flying in, you're flying off. I'm flying off, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, Tony, we're flying off and we're flying out of time. Okay. So, and we've got no more questions. It's a good time to, to close. That's great. That was good. So thank you questions. very much. I'll just, um, that book, um, if you just uh, email me the, the title again, because we have a few more questions about that. Sure. I will send out this recording to everybody tomorrow. And I'll send you the slides as well then. And I will send out slides, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I will always send out, also send out the, the book, the title of the book. Great. So thank you very, very much. And thank you all very much. for. Okay, Jane, and thank coming. you for all coming. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thanks a million. Thank Bye. you. Thank you both. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much.